It's lovely coming back to Cambridge. It's very nice to see everyone. I began some of my grown-up intellectual journey um, just across this balcony at Westcott House, um, rooming with a um, Palestinian Orthodox priest, a Catholic nun, and a, a Canadian astrophysicist. Yeah. And I uh, have such fond memories of Cambridge, and IOX has given me an opportunity to return several times, and I'm very grateful. The talk um, today is important. The topic is important to everyone who possesses a human body, and it deals with medical materialism. Materialism is quite an ancient philosophical doctrine, um, and uh, the essence of it, the core of it, is that the universe is atoms and the void, just atoms and the void, and that if you cut and splice and divide and discover enough of everything that exists, um, you are left with materials, with matter. Everything we've heard today thus far, I try to count how many times other speakers said mind or spirit or consciousness. And so in all of our lives, even the non-theologians live in a world where these subjective interpretations of human experience are very powerful, they play a huge role in our lives, and they're separate from matter. And so I'll give you the perspective of a practicing neurosurgeon. I have a practice in New Orleans. Um, I've been there for 10 years. And um, we'll set some definitions first. I think um, you all are familiar with um, uh, what neurosurgeons do. Um, I will... Um, See if you can get a full image of um, um, of my screen, um, and you are not. You're seeing just a truncated image of the screen, so I will try to um, reduce this. Um, and we will make it small enough for everyone to see. Um, There are slides. All of my slides are in this size, so unfortunately you have to bear with me. I have to get it just right. Okay, so obviously there's a element of narcissism required to practice neurosurgery. And part of it is a defense mechanism to do something so barbaric as to drill open people's heads. Um, most people come to us for dire medical needs, uh, but some Tibetan monks practice trepanation to allow the third eye of the universe to the noose to enter, uh, to enter the mind. And so um, in my practice, everything is voluntary. Um, and this idea that Dear Lord, I'm on call, I've got it, reflects a little bit the pressure that we feel under when taking a well person to surgery to fix perhaps a tumor or an aneurysm and hoping that you can discharge them from the hospital and be sure that they are still themselves. Now, the body is very important to personhood. An amputation, even a new haircut, changes how people feel. When we shave someone's head for surgery, which we seldom do these days, uh, they're very upset about it. But removing the substance inside, which might alter their thoughts, is very frightening. And so this idea that you're trusting someone with your personhood brings people in front of us in very vulnerable circumstances and it is an encounter which um, is, can be very tense and it can be very touching. As you go to confession to your confessor father, you might go to your doctor and say, I'm very worried about this. And I think it's more true when the next thing that happens is you get cut on. Um, now, 
we all know that IOX could not book a rocket scientist for today, so that's why I'm here. But really, when you when people have any sort of esteem for what is difficult in these professions, in the proverbial jokes, it's because rocket physics is truly difficult at an intellectual level, and it's hard to get it just right. But with neurosurgery, the esteem and the mystique comes from the fact that the organ is esoteric. The profession is not esoteric. We are still barber surgeons, people doing plumbing, biological carpentry, but the subject of the operation is. So um, prior to my uh, surgical career, I, was, I started off with research in brain development and I studied brain development in children in a basic science kind of thing, uh, analyzing EEG, uh, functional MRIs, behavioral testing, and looked at some grand unified theory of how the brain develops. If we take it back to antiquity, the brain was not always regarded as the seat of the mind. If I ask you in Egypt, um, the weighing of the heart in front of Anubis that measured your sins was not the weighing of the brain. It was the weighing of the heart. The Egyptians, in fact, in mummifying, extracted the brain through the nose and discarded it. They thought it was just, just a, a bad bit of uh, 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 liquid. Um, the heart, however, was thought to be the seat of the mind in this multilingual group here, you probably all know a dozen words that mean heart, even in other languages or expressions, phrases. I can say uh, lev or kalb or uh, kardia or in Sanskrit ridaya, uh, corazon, cor, inima. Uh, I'm familiar with them just from general culture. How many do I know I'm a neurosurgeon? I don't know how to say brain more in more than my native language in English. And the truth is that we've attributed for much of history the qualities of what we call mind to the heart and by extension to other parts of the body. So the fact that the brain is the seat of the mind is a modern concept. And I think these days, people assume it's a kind of biological computer. It's a very sophisticated computer. The neocortex has 16 billion neurons. The paleocortex, the cerebellum, which is smaller in size, has about 70 billion neurons. And together, they make 100 plus trillion synapses. And so as a biological computer, it's very sophisticated, and we are just at the beginning of probing its depths. The mind on the other side, we can talk about conscious mind, the non-conscious mind. The mind has sensory input, but the mind also generates non-sensory things and thoughts which do not depend on seeing anything. And the mind is, in my estimation, non-physical. Non so there won't be too many surgical pictures, but I want to show you that the brain is biological tissue and it very much is part of the meat robot that a human being is. And in this meat robot, we expect to find the processes of consciousness. And materialists in medicine are the prevailing school of thought. And the belief is that thought has evolved as a reaction to this neurotransmitter being released, this synapse being activated, and this function, the hand being activated to move for defense, for feeding, for reproduction, for various purposes. So 
Is it true then that the mind can emerge from this tissue as something distinct from the tissue? And what is that? Um, the Baha'i faith describes progressive revelation. So as a, as a kind of a, um, a humorous uh, um, example, I've put a progressive revelation of neuroscience, of neuroanatomy. Uh, the phrenologists in the 19th century thought there were distinct regions and each part of the head did something different. And that was based on the structural morphology. They saw there were waves in the brain, sulci and gyri, and they identified maybe if you poke here, if you have a problem here, language declines or this part moves your hand. Well, Broadman and others subsequently found that the function was not reliant on just one area or one region, but on categories of cells that were next to each other. So neighboring cells do kind of similar things. And in modern neuroscience, we see that really the processes of the brain are part of a connectome. They're circuits. They're not distinct areas. They're circuits. And those circuits are physical, biological, but they're also neurochemical. Um, in surgery, we can look at craniometric stuff, sort of frontal, occipital, temporal, and then we expose the surface and we look at its vasculature and we look at the cortex and then we dissect it and we see um, in the image on the far right that the white matter is a kind of telephone array connecting this very complex cortical surface to the rest of the brain. And here are some comparisons in size, just to give you an idea of the human brain compared to others. And, you know, you, you see in the center is a polar bear. A polar bear is a much bigger organism than a human being. So, but the, its brain is quite a bit smaller. To what extent can we believe that the, if the, if the mind is a product of the biological brain, does its size matter uh, in an organism? Is an organism that is larger or bigger, that has longer nerves or bigger nerves, do they have more mind or more consciousness? And intuitively, we know that's wrong. So we understand that there is a separation between what is purely biological and the result of those biological functions. Um, so here is, uh, you know, an example of axonal connections in the brain. This is obtained with a very high resolution diffusion MRI. And we see that the white matter provides the relay wires to the cortical surface where 70% of the brain activity happens. Um, now, what is this brain activity? Well, a lot of, a lot of our thoughts, 70% or plus of our thoughts are abstract thoughts. They're not thoughts that mean press this button, move this arm, they're abstractions. Um, and yet when we try to identify morphologically what does what in the brain, all we can find are structural things that, that, that are of a very simple order. Um, if we look at morphology, there is an MRI scan, which is then labeled with the circuits of the brain. And if we scan those circuits very, very, very finely, there is an image there, a DTI image of a, of a hippocampus where you can almost see the cell arrangements, the cellular arrangements. No matter how deep we probe in its structure, I don't believe it fully um, explains its function. Now, the way that these connectomes work, the way that uh, the circuits are connected, this is an example of a patient of mine with a, with a tumor near the uh, arcuate fasciculus connecting the speech centers, receptive speech that understands speech and productive speech. And we can select that on imaging, make everything else go away and look at just that. Um, now I have some um, examples of the work. Um, now this is from the operating theater. We can do a chemical visualization where we inject chemicals. This is a, a fluorescent injection. We can use um, other chemicals to look at how the tissue looks differently um, and then we have functional MRI. 
of functional MRI is when we are presenting a visual task, for example, in this case to a patient, they're looking at something and we can see where blood flow in the brain is higher. So what areas get activated? And that's when we can test when musicians are playing music versus an amateur is playing music, do similar areas of the brain get activated or not? Um, here is my operating room. And we are now with a subject under surgery undergoing a tumor resection. And I am stimulating on the screen um, areas of the brain that are supposedly responsible um, for movement to check if the leg will move. Very important experiments were done in the mid 20th century by Wilder Penfield at the Montreal Neurological Institute with over 1,100 awake craniotomy patients and cortical stimulation. And when stimulating various areas of the brain, we can make people move an arm or leg. We can also make people recall painful memories. We can make the patient have emotional states of extreme joy or elation or tearfulness but we cannot make anyone think an abstract thought. Even though abstract thinking is the majority of what the brain does. Um, this is an example of a patient whose optic nerve we're monitoring through that sensor. And we stimulate it with bright lights to make sure that the nerve continues to function uh, during surgery. Um, Benjamin Leibert in the 80s is a scientist who um, used a lot of brainwave recordings for somewhat related purposes for decision making. And he came up with this paradigm where a patient was asked to press a button when they had made a decision about something. And brainwaves were recorded as the decision making process was going, but he didn't know when the patient would press the button. Well, the patient would press the button, and when he analyzed past recordings, there was a wave, a spike in electrical activity, which he called the readiness potential, which was a fraction of a second or half a second before the button was pressed. So, um, Leibniz just wrote a neuroscience paper about it, but many interpreted it to mean we have no free will. Before a decision is made, the brain has already given you the spike. And so you're just doing what the meat robot is supposed to do because your brain told you so. So Leibniz had a very clever additional step to this experiment. He told the patient, decide to do this thing and then don't do it. And there was a spike of the readiness potential when he said, I will, but there was not when he then didn't. And so some cognitive theories say that this is an example of free will, maybe better expressed as free won't. I have the will to not do it. And so all of the ascetic traditions that say abstain from this, avoid that, whether that in itself has utility biologically, not eating pork or fasting for 24 hours instead of six, or it, we know it has a role in exercising this free won't, which is a uniquely human capacity and is not just predicated on biology. And so we're just probing the ways in which we can escape the meat computer slightly and be conscious beings. Um, so I'll give you some surgical case examples. And the anecdotes with them reflect what I think is important about the mind. This is a 59-year-old female, um, and she presented with metastatic melanoma. And you can see 
in the middle of her brain, in the thalamus, between the hemispheres, is a tumor that has to be removed. Um, she's going to die if we don't operate. If we operate, she's going to live maybe six to 24 months. And with this news, she has to make a deal with the surgeon and with God. So one approach is, and what medicine teaches the patients, they well, get informed consent, ask the guy, how many of these have you done before? Were they exactly in the same place in the thalamus? What is the percentage that they turned out right? How many of them were themselves? And so as the recipient of those questions, I think, yes, patients should be informed about what's going to happen. But how can I say of the 150 trillion synapses, how many will be preserved and how will they function? Of the billions of neurons that are invisible to me, even under the microscope, how can I guarantee that I'm going to do a good job? Now, this is a good example to discuss another experiment of um, early neurosurgeons, which is to get to it, one way to get to it would be to cut straight down the middle through the connection between the two hemispheres, the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum integrates left and right hemispheres. And everything in the body is crossed. So we know that the left brain moves the right hand and vice versa. And the left visual field is seen by the right occipital lobe. So if the mind was all biology and you did a corpus callosotomy, you should end up with two people or at least two brains. And so an elegant experiment that was done was to take patients who've had a corpus callosotomy and show them something in the left visual field and then ask them, what letter is this? Well, um, the hemispheres are not connected, so they can see it with one side. They can see it with the right side, but to produce speech, they need the left side of the brain. So they can't say the name of the letter. They say, I, I know what it is, uh, I but I can't name it. But they could draw it in the left visual field on a piece of paper what it is. And so then we asked them, we said, okay, when I show you the letter, the same letter, I want you to press a button. And they could press that button with either hand because they're not two people. There is a mind process that overrides the limitations of perception and allows something perceived only in this aspect of biology to be executed elsewhere. And so um, this lady had a very good operation. I didn't do a corpus callosotomy. I went through the ventricle. It was removed. She did very well as far as I, could, I was concerned. And she was happy with her deal, even though there was a lot of negotiating about what can you guarantee, how can you guarantee it. Now, this is another patient, a 41-year-old female, a nurse, kept running into neighbors' mailboxes because she has this large tumor in the right parietal cortex. And on radiology, left and right are backwards. So you'll hear me saying silly things, but the left of the screen is the right of the brain. And the tumor is here. It's a benign tumor, and we get to cure her. But there's also all this swelling around it. And so now we have some bit of brain that's been destroyed, but really a lot of the brain has just been temporarily damaged. This is visual integration and spatial integration. So it's very disoriented in space. Her approach to it said, I want to tell you what the risks are. This is in the visual cortex. Her approach to it was, I am praying for you. I have faith and I've made my peace. And I just want you to concentrate on having, doing a good surgery. And as a, as the doctor, it's a huge relief to have that patient because I can be in my zone and worry about it my own way. 
Whereas if the patient says, well, have you slept enough last night? Are your hands going to shake? Did you have a glass of something? Or did you, I heard that coffee gives you tremors, you know? And so people get very carried away with it. And so the faith element, of course, is very useful to us because it frees some of that pressure. But more importantly, it allows me to believe that it isn't all in my hands. Because if it was, no amount of narcissism would allow one to become a neurosurgeon. We have to believe it isn't all in my hands. And so if it isn't all in my hands, whose hands is it in? Well, you, the sick person, you know, it's your responsibility to heal and to get better. But in the act of modifying the organ of their consciousness, there is a, a closeness, an intimacy, which, you know, the heart surgeons are always the ones who say, well, you know, put your hand here and hold it while it's pumping in surgery. And isn't this impressive? And yes, it is. But I think even more amazing is to hold the brain in your hand and to realize that it isn't all in your hand, that you are two conscious beings sharing a repair process, but that the mind of that person can live beyond the organ itself. So this patient had a good operation. There, there, there is her brain afterwards. We, all the swelling is gone. So um, that's um, good for her. Uh, the, this white pattern is the swelling and her vision return and her function return and she's cured. And we can prove that we did the job we said we did in all kinds of ways. This is more imaging where uh, the hole in the head over there no longer exists. Um, and then on, on this side, um, if you look at this bit here, the brain fibers are moved aside. So um, enough about uh, vision. Now, here is a different, um, a different case. This is a patient who presented with speech arrest and using the wrong words, particularly for sides. You know, so if she were saying the creed, I think she would have said, you know, an ascetic on the on the left side of the father. And and there are grammatical errors which could escape one. And then you have a brain scan and behold, here is a tumor. And she has a history of metastatic breast cancer. And this is most likely a, a lesion from breast cancer. But it is immediately adjacent to Broca's speech area in the left hemisphere, the speech area is pushed up and forwards. And so if in cutting it out, we make a mistake, she will not, she'll be able to understand, but will not be able to speak. So uh, we mapped out the tumor there. We open up the brain, it looks fairly normal. We uh, dig around a bit with, uh, without damaging the normal cortex. There's the lesion and there it comes out. And now her speech area there is intact. She is able to speak again. And that bit has been removed. The histopathology showed that it was indeed a, a cancer med. So we could certainly in this patient make her mute. So if we did so, would we have diminished her mind? Would she still be herself? My belief is that she would, but she couldn't say very much about it. But that the ability to harm a function does not equate to loss of mind. Would she be less of a person? Would she have less mind? Because now there's less brain. Maybe her brain is now more like that of a polar bear. You know, have we changed her state of consciousness? And, and obviously we haven't. This is a Coast Guard worker who had a seizure while at sea, another young female. And here is a lesion in the motor cortex on the right side. And I won't bore you with all of this, but we can now we can map the brain chemically. We can look at blood flow. We can look at chemistry in the brain. We can see how much the tumor has invaded. And, and there it is. And we can image all of the fibers that have been 
pushed away. There's our corpus callosum we discussed earlier. And this is where the tumor sits. And in surgery, I, I show you this case because in surgery, it's important to um, try to induce the seizures and to identify exactly where the tumor is to localize it. So we put electrodes like that on the brain and we induce seizures. So in our experiments of inducing seizures and monitoring seizures, maybe since modern neurology has been around, uh, a quarter million seizures have been recorded. And these seizures are electrical storms in the brain and they can start with a little shake, but they spread to the rest of the body and the convulsions are so violent that you can lose consciousness. Some of them are just a funny smell, uh, olfactory hallucinations. They're a temporal lobe seizure. Some of the seizures are just a blank stare and a stop. They're called absent seizures. Everything that seizes in the, in the brain can disrupt any physiological function, including loss of bowel and bladder function and so forth. But there has never been an intellectual seizure. No one seizing starts to do computations. No one seizing starts suddenly to um, uh, do multiplications or develop philosophical ideas or uh, express uh, charity or desire or abstract thoughts. And so I go back to the idea that the biological brain, complex as it is, doing so much abstract thinking, when we disrupt its work and we have these electrical storms, these malfunctions, it acts like a fairly base animal organ. It doesn't act like the high level of consciousness that we would expect. Um, so the last case I'll show you is this gentleman. And it's very uh, difficult to appreciate, but uh, this part is darker. This is the left medial temporal lobe. Uh, he has a low-grade glioma there. We think that's what it is. He may need some chemotherapy, so we have to biopsy it. And this circuit in the brain is called the uncinate fasciculus. And the uncinate fasciculus um, is responsible for autonoetic functions, particularly on the left. So autonoesis is a form of self-awareness, um, restraint, and it's a very uh, sensitive uh, area of the brain to personality changes. If we go and cut it across, as you see here in this line drawn from the top, uh, maybe the, the shortest path to biopsying the lesion is not good. If we go underneath it, and we can preserve it, it's better. But in cases where it's been damaged, experiments have shown that silent meditation can make the cells in this uncinate fasciculus recover and in sometimes enlarge. And so one of our uh, audience members is a neuroscientist, and there's something we call functional anisotropy, which is a quality of the the Brownian movement of water molecules inside the neurons tell us how densely packed they are and how organized they are. And we can get them to be more organized through uh, a meditative practice. Uh, the one specifically tested was silence. The free won't of speech. Um, so now that we review these studies, what do we think about this Aquinas uh, materialist axiom that nothing is in the intellect that was not first there through the senses. Clearly through development, we get information through the senses and we think it all goes to the brain now because we're enlightened and we know it's not the heart. Um, there is the first dissection in the world of the entire human nervous system in 1890, 1889. That's at an American University archive now. And that is uh, not a uh, sort of a fictitious illustration. That is a picture of a dissection of the nerves 
in the body. And so aside from the brain, the connections are tremendous. And we have a central nervous system with brain and spinal cord. We have a uh, peripheral nervous system that is somatic, but it's also autonomic. The autonomic is self-propagating. It does its own thing. It regulates heart rate and temperature and sweating and so forth. And that's further divided into sympathetic and parasympathetic. And we have an enteric. An enteric is the nervous system in the gut. And, you know, in referring back to the language, we talk about a gut feeling and a gut reaction and something that is visceral. And we call it the intrinsic nervous system because the gut nervous system can function separately from the rest of the human nervous system if challenged. So um, there's a second brain in the stomach and the nervous system really permeates the whole body. It gets all of this information and cognitive empiricism would kind of tell us the brain is a tabula rasa and on this tabula rasa, the five senses leave their impression. Whatever wasn't there through the five senses never arrived. And yet, once we have enough information, once the human animal is sophisticated enough, the brain has the capacity to learn things that it hadn't ever seen or sensed. So you can explain to someone what the Grand Canyon looks like. They needn't have seen it directly. They needn't have seen something like it if the use of language is sophisticated enough. So the thought that consciousness is a biological process and it's just molecular signaling pathways interacting with other things um, is grounded in biology and it's grounded also in the idea that consciousness is a process that something is happening rather than that something is being um, in my mind it kind of parallels vitalism Vitalism was kind of debunked science of the 19th century where, you know, people said, how does life come about? Well, we can't see how it comes about. So objects must have what they called an elan vital. And so a stone has no elan, so it just sits there. But maybe a, a fly does, and so it can fly off. And so we, through... Uh, biological studies have proven that, you know, life begins at a cellular level and that there is no elan vital we could loan to the stone. And so in a similar way, I think consciousness perhaps is something that we cannot loan as a process to an object that doesn't have it. Um, the biological process also does not explain um, at all intentionality and intentionality is very important because um, Britannia in the 19th century described it as the ability of the mind to be about something, about something that's not itself. Um, matter is not about anything. A stone on the ground is not about anything, but the mind can be about something. It can be about charity. It can be about uh, scheming. It can be about delayed gratification. The ability, this intentionality, leads us to the kind of the grander aboutness, which is teleology. And um, the biological process doesn't explain that. And it doesn't explain other things which we know to be true such as telepathy, which people have proven and experienced, and instinct, which is a shortcut to decision-making processes that many people rely on, including people in business, people in personal relations, and it works just fine. So just because there isn't a way to dissect it, I don't think we can discount it. Um, if we go to Cartesian logic, um, okay, our mind and consciousness linked to us existing as biological beings, 
Um, consciousness allows us to feel what it's like to be something, but consciousness is not purely physical. And so Joseph Lev Levine in the 80s came up with this idea of the explanatory gap, um, explaining how physical properties give rise uh, to the way we feel subjectively, even when they, uh, they're not experienced. And it sort of uh, knowing what something, how something works, cannot predict how it will be for that person. An example is we know that pain is transmitted by the C fibers in the spinal cord. And that's a fact. Pain is transmitted by the C fibers. That knowledge does not inform me how someone else might perceive pain. Um, we know how vision works, um, inverted image on the retina and so forth. We are all looking at a green hill. Our impression of what that is will be so different if I've just come from a green hill that is the burial mound of a family member versus a green hill that was a playground for my child versus the green hill that is the tomb of Genghis Khan. And um, the connections that we each make to those things, that vastness of abstract th thought that is generated from the senses is not predictable by the biology of the brain. So if someone loses a faculty like an amputee, they can still enjoy being told what it's like to walk barefoot. They don't need to experience it again. The pleasure is in their brain inserted through knowledge. So found, uh, consciousness as a foundational substance, as something that is non-physical, but it's a something, is another part of this dualism. So if it's not the body, is it something else? And is that something else observable? Um, so mathematically speaking, there has been an attempt to quantify consciousness using the phi metric. It's a complex equation. You have to look up um, Tononi 2004, Giulio Tononi, but he defined this phi metric with a complex equation where there were logic gates leading to each decision making. And these logic gates could be taken in the neurons of a firefly and calculated all the way out to, pre to predict what was the phi max, how much computing power consciousness could be generated. And um, for the human brain, it requires unrealistic computational power. And it tells us that for consciousness to exist, this physical brain must exist. It's a requirement. The brain with its neurons and neurotransmitters and its logic gates must exist for consciousness to exist. So if we ask, you know, what does it take for a system to be conscious? If all it takes is logic gates, a series of consequences that lead to other consequences, well then, Perhaps the whole universe could be conscious and non-living things could have consciousness. Um, I like this quote, even though it's much quoted. Um, and this is my personal view of it. My summary of it is that rather than the meat robot taking a spiritual journey, a spiritual being is taking a human journey in a human body that has certain visible and analyzable characteristics. That matter is spirit fallen into a state of self-otherness and that the brain as matter has some functional emergent properties that are linked to human thought and required for human thought, um, but are not, but um, these functional emergent properties do not solely rely on the biological basis. We have free will, we have free won't. We know that materialism cannot predict 
thought and behavior. And we know that in a universe of atoms and void, the endless search for more material knowledge leads to a form of nihilism and a hollowness that leads to unhappiness. Um, a similar concept to teleology in um, Japanese studies is ikigai. And ikigai is a kind of uh, teleology of life. So the life force has a purpose. The belief that the life force itself has a purpose was described by, by Kamiya, uh, a Japanese psychiatrist. And we know from our own psychological and psychiatric studies that people who have uh, faith that they are more than the sum of their parts have higher resilience. So people in refugee camps, uh, war victims, uh, people who suffer traumas, they have higher resilience to physical and mental illness because of their system of beliefs than people who have a purely materialistic regard for their own body. Um, this is my last uh, food for thought. Uh, another um, Deschardins quote, the future is more beautiful than all the pasts. If you take this consciousness business maybe a bit too far, there have been cosmologists who've said after the geosphere and the biosphere and the anthroposphere, there will be a noosphere where everything on earth is just interconnected consciousness. And, uh, and uh, um, Deschardins called this the omega point, the point at which it's Christ's second coming and it's light from true light. And in his definition, consciousness is a, is a radial energy that can spread and shake hands with other radial energies. Um, and that this energy extends to all forms of matter. As a neurosurgeon, it's out of my wheelhouse to go too far down the noosphere. Um, I don't like that it conflates science too closely with theology because I believe there is a limitation to the physical scientific investigation of matter. Um, I prefer the analogy of Sri Ramakrishna, who's a Vedic philosopher, um, who describes a pot of water submerged in the ocean. There's water in the pot and there's water in the ocean. And the I consciousness, the self, is the shell of the pot. And when you shed your body, when you fall asleep in the Lord, the pot breaks. Um, so my conclusion and my personal system of beliefs is that the mind is not the brain. My job is to fix the brain and the mind can have a mind of its own, as we so rightly say in English, beyond and outside the brain. I don't think materialism uh, is a valid philosophical school in this century. I think it was fine in the era of Democritus. I think it's just an error. It's a mistake. It's a wrong way of looking at things. I think dualism continues to define experience. Um, and for another definition of consciousness, I give you the priest's silent prayer in the uh, holy anaphora, uh, which includes the words, for you are God ineffable, inconceivable, invisible, incomprehensible, ever existing, yet ever the same. You and your only begotten son and your Holy Spirit, you brought us out of non-existence into being and again raised us up when we had fallen and left nothing undone until you brought us to heaven and gave us your kingdom to come. So I don't need a new sphere. I think it's already been defined. Um, but I leave you with this idea that mind and brain are separate and that consciousness is non-physical. Thank you.
Well, Sebastian has managed to keep us awake in the most difficult slots after lunch. But uh, being a neurosurgeon, he knew what centers to uh, to touch <laughs> to uh, keep us awake. Thank you so much for an amazingly interesting presentation. And we don't have that kind of presentation um, often. So it's really a special uh, a special uh, uh, session for us. And um, we don't have that much time for questions. Um, I mean, I was it's... afraid of questions, so I just covered everything up front. Yes. <laughs> okay, Father Dragos. Oh, you need the mic, of course, yes. But if you want coffee, you'll have to keep it short. Yeah, I'll be short. Yes. Yes. Um, so just to say, thank you, Sebastian. Um, I, I'll, I speak in my personal name or when I say this, but uh, this to me was one of the most seminal talks I've ever attended uh, in the last 12 months or something at least. So really, thank you very much. I generally say this um, because it, it, it helped me clarify some things that I was thinking about and some things that I wasn't sure I was thinking about. Uh, and, and you've helped with some answers and connections. So thank you for that. And one of the things that I was reminded as you were talking, so this is not a question, but more of a comment, and I apologize for this, was one of the words of a prayer uh, during the service of baptisms. One of the last prayers when people, are, when we prepare the person to be tonsured. And one of the lines there says, it depends on the translation in English, but it says that you created the human being in your image, O Lord, and you've placed everything rightly in the body so that the body might serve the soul. And I, I think your presentation has made me understand that sentence in a way that I haven't so far. Um, so thank you for that. Yeah. Please. Because of your comment about the mind is not the brain, I agree with you. Can there be a mind process without a brain? I'm thinking of children born without a brain, anencephaly, I think it's So like... we know that uh, there are very few cases of children born without a brain. And so it's not a studied thing that I know about. But we know that people who are in a coma, in a minimally conscious state, um, have abilities which are not, they're not supposed to have. Some of the experiments were actually done here in Cambridge by someone who's uh, moved to Ontario University now in an fMRI with patients who were in a profound coma for years, could not communicate with anyone, could not open their eyes, could not move. And in, a, uh, in an fMRI, uh, they started speaking to the patient and describing certain colors and describing uh, family members, and they could see areas of the brain light up. So they started uh, giving them sentences that made sense uh, with descriptions that they knew were true, like your brother John was born in New York State, and specific areas would light up on the functional MRI. Uh, of course, many people say, well, they can't hear. That's not possible. And so then they presented those sentences with the words out of semantic order, nonsense talk. And the areas did not light up. And depending on what was being described, different areas had blood flow, like the area that's responsible for vision. And so even in minimally conscious states, the mind exists. A much thornier and more difficult question is in near-death experiences or out-of-body experiences without a body at all, does the mind exist? What I, I was wondering is... Uh... I was reading um, some time back about uh, the life of um, Jung and that uh, under two different times, he went through what uh, was described as a personality shift. And that this, in one case, was connected with a period of illness and high fever. 
So you were saying that uh, we don't have any uh, instances where somebody would suddenly gain some, you know, abstractability. Um, but are there instances where through some uh, illness or through some sort of damage, the person could undergo um, a transformation in personality. You had mentioned something. So I'm just curious about uh, the connection between, between this. So you end up with a different person. Yes. So um, you end up with the same person with a different consciousness. Mm. And in fact, Every experience, however trivial, rewrites the software of all previous memories. Every time we recall something, we've made a new memory of the memory. And so we exist in the moment as a mind clone of all the previous versions of our mind. And experiences which are perhaps shocking or dramatic, we remember as giant episodes the 30-second the car crash could play out, take up as much brain space as a year of your life. Uh, a spiritual experience on a retreat could occupy, it could feel like a different lifetime compared to all the other days that just disappear on daily life. So our per, the brain's perception of time and how it records that attributes it different levels of importance. But... Um, in the states of, say, there is a famous uh, case, and I don't want to go too far over time. There's a famous case of a patient undergoing a brain surgery where all of the blood flow to the brain had to be stopped because of a blood vessel, an aneurysm that had to be treated. And so the patient was put on a, a heart-lung machine and uh, put on, uh, at a very low body temperature, iced down to 60 degree Fahrenheit, and um, there was no brain activity for 60 minutes. They were in profound anesthesia on ice for 60 minutes. While one of my colleagues in Arizona, the mayor of the um, Barrow Clinic repaired the aneurysm. She woke up from the surgery, everything was fine. And she could recall, and she told this very uh, um, prominent neurosurgeon um, that um, she saw him perform the operation from outside her body. And she could describe the tools that he that were unique to him, that even another neurosurgeon wouldn't know what he used to perform it. She went on to write a book about it. Her name is Pam Reynolds. She wrote a book about it. But it's one of the, um, you know, I would say about 20% of the reported near-death experiences are verifiable medically. And in all of those states, the patients describe an expanded consciousness, not a contractile, an extend, an expanded consciousness and a feeling of knowing everything all at once um, and often looking from outside and seeing what the surgeons are doing to the body. And then you return to the body, I guess, you wake up and now you use the language of humans to attribute it colors and shapes and so forth and information that would normally be seen through the eyes. But um, to me, that is another example of the mind being different than the body. Please. I wanted to ask you whether you ever have the feeling uh, you did very uh, parenthetically mention a connection between your vocation and like a priestly ministry. And I sometimes was struck suddenly by like this a little bit of a deja vu uh, from liturgy, from watching the way the priest washes his hands, which might mistakenly be somehow you know, associated with pilot. I don't know. It's not because of pilot, but be, I, I, I suddenly I, I was watching some, you know, TV series of surgeons sort of ritualizing mm -hmm. this washing of the hands that obviously they don't just do for ritual reasons. But I guess my question is, do you feel a connection or something that reminds you of? I mean, I realize the problems of making this connection, especially with the hand washing. Uh, because it's like, well, it's a sacrificial uh, act 
that pagan priests would also do before they would sacrifice um, wh whatever or whomever, you know. Uh, but it, it, you know, if we go with this with this analogy, you are um, you are causing uh, certain pain, even though we have anesthesia now, in order to bring about healing and new life in some shape or form, right? So I don't know. I I do you ever have this feeling like, because I, I have one friend, she's a female neurosurgeon uh, in the area of Boston, and she often has to accompany people in their dying moments, not because she's a bad neurosurgeon, <laughs> uh, but just because that happens. Anyway, do you feel sometimes like a priest is what I'm asking? Um, the part of the liturgy that I most identify with is when the priest before communion, walks out of the altar and bows to the people and say, uh, forgive me, my brothers, uh, I'm a sinner, you know? And, and I feel going in front of my patients, I feel like that. I feel like this unworthy person is going to do their best. And so in that sense, you know, I, I feel that. But I, I honestly feel for the priest, I think, oh, you know, you're, you're human too. You you have this heavy burden of the liturgy on you. And and I think that in some way, this communion uh, with their life and death and this contact with their consciousness does create that link. I feel more like the bond, a confession, than, you know, uh, standing in front of the parish. Um, I feel that the patient has that trust of, I will show you everything and tell you everything. Help me through this difficult moment. And you feel like a guide uh, that's just one step ahead of them. But we have to have this humbleness that it isn't all us. Because if I think it's all me and they die or something goes bad, then I can't do the next patient and the next operation. And question. The good news is that we have Sebastian with us for a few good hours. And also we have the last uh, session for discussion uh, tomorrow. So for whatever questions will be asked now, perhaps leave it for then. But um, let's thank Sebastian for his talk and have some talk. <laughs>